This podcast is part of the Some Buddies Network. You're never alone when you've got some buddies. Hello again, everyone. Welcome back to the Best Darn Diddly Review Show. This is a weekly podcast for anyone who loves The Simpsons, or ever has loved The Simpsons, hosted by two dudes that grew up on The Simpsons. My name is Miles, better known as Mr. Most Days Off, and today we are... Well, we're gonna lower the bar, I guess. We're talking about the summer of four foot two, but of course, joining me, as always, your co-host with the most, who's not that much taller, Richie the Whiz Kid. How you doing today, Rich? I am a little much taller than that, so... <laughs> <laughs> I'm no giant, but compared to four foot two, I'm I'm doing all right. I will say you could help her get something off of like the middle shelf. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> I know how to stand on the bottom to get to the top. <laughs> I meant the shelf, not Lisa. <laughs> this conversation is going nowhere fast, so let me go ahead and throw it back to you, the man, the myth, the M three twenty. It is Miles. <laughs> I will proudly celebrate our nation's freedom by blowing up a small portion of it. I I love that line. It might be my favorite in the episode, but probably will change that before we're done. Uh, (laughs) Richie, we're here, man. We're here. We're at the summer of four foot two, which is an episode that we've talked about a lot on the way through this season. It's the last episode of the season, the season finale. And it's the Lisa episode that I think both of us have probably pinpointed as at least from our memories, the possibly best, I, I'll just say it, I think it's the best Lisa episode ever, or at least so far. I actually, I think I agree still. My issue with this, and, and I mention this all the time on our show, is that through these first, probably through the first like 10 to 12 seasons, I've seen all the episodes so many times that like I remember every scene, every moment. And so I just sit back and laugh and then write my notes. With this episode, I was basically like in my notebook writing the entire time. And like I was listening and I could like see that the episode in my head. But it was weird to me. Like usually I write like one line of of a note. And on this, every time I wrote a note, it was multiple lines. And I don't really say anything that like important. But like for some reason, it's like I could see the whole episode in my mind because of how much I like it. You know, and then you go back and watch it again. <laughs> <laughs> Interesting. I'm I'm very curious to hear about what you're going to have to say. So uh, why don't we go ahead and dive into the episode so we can get to those lengthy, lengthy notes I'm eager to hear. Uh, we are talking about Summer of Four Foot Two, which originally aired on May 19th, 1996. Uh, this is a parody, or the title is a parody, of the movie Summer of 42, which is a 1971 coming-of-age film that showrunner Bill Oakley recommends that everyone over the age of 18 checks out at some point. Very interesting. <laughs> also, that was a lot of numbers. Yeah, that was a lot of numbers, and I'm going to throw some more at you, actually, because this episode aired on May 19, 1996, as I mentioned Along with, apparently, the episode Homer Palooza, which we talked about last week, I could not find out any other information about why this occurred. I I googled and searched around, I listened to commentaries of both episodes, I could find no additional information other than I believe these episodes played back-to-back in May... As the season finale, I guess maybe it was just a special event to, like, close off The Simpsons, or possibly there was some sporting event the previous week that would have caused it to move? I, I Again, I was not able to actually figure out an answer to that, but I thought it was interesting that these episodes played on the same date. On IMDb, they're both listed as May 19th. On the commentary, Josh Weinstein does actually say May 12th, which I thought was interesting, but I could find no other... Um, no other source that s- confirmed that, essentially. That's all right, Miles. Just because he said it doesn't mean he's true. I mean, sometimes when you're talking to Bill Oakley, you say things that are incorrect about it. So that's <laughs> <nice>. <laughs> <laughs> Roasted me. Well, we'll get through season six eventually, Richie. <laughs> I still cannot believe I said that. I'm so embarrassed, but shit happens. It's not the dumbest thing I'll do on this show. Uh, probably isn't and won't be. <laughs> So, uh, moving on, moving on, yeah, (laughs) point proven. 
Uh, since we did talk about it, though, uh, the commentary on this one doesn't in- include Josh Weinstein, Bill Oakley, David Silverman, Dan Graney, and Yardley Smith, the voice of Elisa Simpson herself. There is no chalk gag on this episode, which means that a total of seven of 25 episodes throughout the season had chalk gags. I just wow. thought that was incredible. Less than a third yeah. of the episodes, which is is seemingly out of character, uh, but funny that that happens during one of arguably the top rated seasons of the show's history. There is a repeat couch gag on this one. It's the fax machine printout where the Simpsons family prints out through the couch cushions and then quickly kind of like lands underneath the couch disappearing. And we open on the last day of school where Milhouse and Bart are very excited. They're already making summer plans, specifically which type of sprinklers are they going to play in first? I will say that while I don't know that we're going to get this across super well in a podcast, (laughs) the way that this scene plays out with the animation of Milhouse imitating three different types of sprinklers was actually hella impressive because immediately I knew exactly what they were talking about when he demonstrates. Yeah, man. Um, I alluded to this at the top of the episode, but a lot of my notes in this episode are, are about animation items that I noticed. So that's what most of it is. But yes, there's a, there's a lot of fun in this one, man, on that you don't get on the script. That's just, you have to animate it. So it looks fantastic. I totally understand Millhouse's feelings. Yeah, this very, very much captures that feeling of being a kid in school on the last day right before summer break. And I love the uh, the premature <laughs> summer vacation, I guess we'll say. Shut up, Miles! <laughs> School's out! <laughs> up yours, Miles! <laughs> Millhouse goes screaming, running, cursing Kerbopple, and he gets all the way outside, and uh, we look back and see the rest of the class is still sitting patiently. <laughs> I'm glad the rest of you remember that summer vacation starts at the end of the day, not the beginning. And Officer Lou comes in, hands Millhouse back. Here you go, ma'am. Ooh, quick work. How did you know he was going to run? Uh, we got someone on the inside. <laughs> and immediately <laughs> you see everybody. <laughs> everybody stares at Martin. <laughs> I mean, it's like calling the kettle black or whatever that saying is, right? Yeah. I also do love, though, that it seems like they're just waiting because they just have one of these every year. Yep, exactly. (laughs) We cut over to the yearbook editor's room where we see Lisa and the yearbook staff opening up the yearbooks, which I think it's funny that they come in on the very last day of school. Yeah, there's Uh, no room for editing or or making sure it's correct right there. Or like a late delivery or anything, yeah. Yeah. I do really like this small joke here where Lisa cuts the box and ends up cutting into the top book because I legitimately have that fear anytime I open yes. an Amazon package. I'm always <laughs> like, oh, I'm going to cut what's inside if I use a knife. Uh, but yeah, I, I do like that they pay that off by just having the one she picks up has this giant gash across the middle. And she just kind of like drops the knife to the side. I was like, this is very anti-Lisa. She's already got this this swagger about her that she's been searching for. She's definitely going to evolve, though, in this, but I, I guess I could see that. She's already showing a little bit of... Um, she's a little cocky. I don't know if cocky is the right word. I think just confidence. Like, she's she feels really proud of what she's accomplished in this yearbook. And again, at this point in the episode, Lisa hasn't had that realization that, like, in her mind, like, doing these things is, like, going to make her cool and popular. Even at one point, she even says, like, I don't get it. I was like the yearbook editor and captain of the nerd team and like head nerd. And I'm still not popular. (laughs) We'll get to the line in the script eventually, but yeah, um, I may have paraphrased it slightly. I do want to say before we're getting into the yearbook stuff that this episode always like worried me like at yearbook time or made me want to get all my friends to sign my yearbook. And I don't, every time I see this episode, I have that feeling and it flashes me back. Cause again, this episode came out what in the sixth grade for us. So like that's when in those middle school years where you want all your friends, you start liking you. Well, you've already been liking the girls and you want all the girls you really like to sign your yearbook. And and you want to sign something super clever and like, yeah, like yeah. you have to say the right thing so that like she'll know that you want to like, you know, see each other this summer and like, but like you don't want to be like too eager. And yes. there's, a, there's an art to the signing of a yearbook, kids, to those of you who are listening, whose parents are fucking irresponsible. But <laughs> <laughs> But this episode definitely brought, like, all those feelings back. 
Yeah, it, again, it does a really good job in general of uh, really capturing the feelings of both leading up to summer, the yearbook signing, the summer vacation itself. Like, a lot of that, uh, again, a lot of it is through animation, which is tricky about this episode, but it just has this feeling about it where it, it feels like a different Simpsons episode. It does not feel like a standard episode. At this point, I will say it still does, but it's quickly going to... Uh, morph and transform into something just a little bit different, though it still has the great Simpsons heart and humor. Yeah, honestly, my the only thing that hurt this episode for me was the fact that, like, we are adults now that have jobs. So, like, this episode made me feel like a kid at, because it's summer vacation time, but the fact that we don't get that anymore, I was like, oh, I don't have all the same feelings about that part. <laughs> <laughs> So we do get to the end of the day where Miss Hoover is actually telling the history of Abe Lincoln and she gets all the way to where he's sitting in the Ford Theater uh, and then the bell rings and she's like, ah, that's enough. Everyone get out, basically. She even goes as far as to say, John Wilkes Booth entered, drew his gun and ring, 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 ring. <laughs> but what happened in Ford's theater? Was President Lincoln okay? He was fine. And then the one, there's Chuck, the kid named Chuck, according to the script, and Ralph Wiggum. Chuck is, like, cool, and he leaves, but Ralph just sits there still with his arm raised. Go home, Ralph. <laughs> As the students flood the halls, Lisa is excited to announce that, remember, at the beginning of the school year, oh. we gave all of you a colored ticket. I hope all of you still have yours. And, of course, nobody freaking has it. I feel like this actually happened in real life, too, Miles. Like, I feel like when you bought your yearbook, they gave you something that you're supposed to hold on to. I don't recall that, honestly, but I definitely know that I would not have been the right person to have <laughs> kept that ticket. I literally lose my, as you know, I lose my movie tickets between buying them at the box office and getting to the, like, ticket taker somehow. It's a problem that has called me more than yeah i've had that issue more than (laughs) once we'll say where i've like dude i just bought my ticket i don't know where it went (laughs) that's the the you know what cargo pants are a blessing and a curse (laughs) (laughs) we'll get better mouse we'll get better uh so who died made Nels- Lisa the boss though nelson pipes up and makes a strong point there who died and made you boss Mr. Esta is the publications advisor. I edited the whole thing. Eh, if you hadn't done it, some other loser would have, so quit milking it. <laughs> <laughs> and then he just throws them out to everybody, even though they cost money. And this next scene does a really great job at setting up the emotional arc for this episode, because we see two scenes, where it's really kind of one connected scene, but two two points of view about this yearbook signing situation we have lisa who is walking around by herself going up to crowds of people and she even hands her yearbook asking to get it signed and you can see it slowly get passed around the entire circle not one person the entire time bothering to even open it and it gets back to her still in its entirely blank state Mm. very sad honestly and you can you can actually feel the the like emotional pain Lisa's experiencing in that moment like that would be the most at that age I I don't know that I could think of a worse like social situation I, I it's it's up there we'll say why didn't Janie sign it yeah Maybe like even her it. friends who were just in the carpool lane earlier this evening if you were watching it chronologically in Omer <laughs> uh doesn't even bother to sign but Uh, On the other hand, you've got Bart, who is in the exact opposite situation. And admittedly, this is the type of stuff that I remember in my mind. Just like I've said before, I idolized Bart. This was like the coolest kid ever. Uh, Such a douche in so many ways. And, and, you know, looking back, I'm like, oh, what an idiot. But like at the same time, in this moment, he's literally got a line of girls like hanging out waiting just to get his yearbook not even like everybody just wants to have their yearbook signed by bart he's got millhouse essentially like being the person if you've ever waited in line to get an autograph there's always like the assistant that's there to like take pictures and like give you like the rules and stuff like that introduce uh millhouse is like this is becky she's in second grade hi becky thanks for coming out and then Becky reads back what he wrote. See ya. 
He writes the way people talk. And then Whoa. we get another person in line, though. <laughs> Your daughter is named Seymour? Well, I, uh, yeah, I, uh, I, I lied. It's, uh, it's for me. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, this makes sense, Miles. One of Lisa's accomplishments in the yearbook is most popular student sister, so, you know. That's, that's a good point. You know, she does have a lot of accolades listed under that image of hers. And this is that line that we were talking about earlier where Lisa even says, I don't get it. Straight A's, perfect attendance, bathroom timer. I should be the most popular girl in school. <laughs> that's what you get for listening to the system. Well, and that just goes to show that Lisa's very smart in her way, but she still does not get the, the social structure of life as much as Bart does. Uh, well, how come Milhouse didn't sign her yearbook either, Miles? Well, he will later, Richie, in the Ooh. creepiest scene ever. <laughs> See you in the car, Richie. I guess, I guess we don't have that moment if he signs it now. That's true. <laughs> We cut to the Simpsons' home, where we see Homer being a complete ass to Flanders in one of the funniest ways possible, because Flanders has found himself in a jimmy of a pickle there, Rich. He, uh, you see, he was supposed to go to his summer vacation home at the beach, but he got jury duty. <laughs> I love this entire time that, like, Flanders is essentially offering his vacation home to Homer. Homer is making, like, the hand gesture of, like, come on, get it out, hurry up, you're wasting my time. This scene's just a... Uh, oh, 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 oh. I don't know, Miles. <laughs> I love this scene. I think it's fantastic. <laughs> Ned, Ned essentially offers it up, and then Homer's response is... I only get two lousy weeks of vacation and you want me to waste it at your stupid beach house? What's in it for me? So Ned actually offers to check Homer's septic tank and Homer's like, there you go. You give a little, you get a little. Oh, and then it cuts to Homer in the hammock in the backyard with Flanders actually getting ready to stick his hand down this really brown piece of grass. Even, like, is, like, stomping around being like, oh, there you are, brown brown lawn. Oh. <laughs> and even at, like, the, the way that, like, they are such jerks to the Flanders, even though the Flanders are, again, offering them their home, we immediately cut to dinner and Marge is like, and you're sure the Flanders won't be there? Well, it sounds great. <laughs> that is a great vacation, Miles. <laughs> Marge says that the kids are both allowed to invite a friend. Bart can bring Milhouse, and Lisa can also bring a friend. <laughs> hey, great. A friend. <laughs> or a companion. Or, I don't know, stuffed animal? So we cut to Lisa actually packing, and Marge is asking who she invited, and Lisa's like, friend? <laughs> These are my only friends, and we see her holding up books by uh, Gore Vidal, for one, who she even, Lisa points out, Gore Vidal even kissed more boys than I ever will. Girls, Lisa. Boys kiss girls. <laughs> <laughs> that joke's a, a bit dated, you might say, but it is funny because Gore, Va Gore Vidal is actually a author, an American writer, I should say. Uh, and it does say on his IMDb page, or, uh, first I'll say he was born in 1925 and lived to July 31st of 2012, and he had a 50-year relationship with a man by the name of Howard Austin, who, oddly enough, this is all according to the IMDb page, but they claim that they did not actually have a sexual relationship, and it's easier to sustain a relationship when sex plays no part. <laughs> <laughs> and it's, oh, and they furthermore said, and it's impossible, they've observed when it does. Interesting <laughs> observations, sirs. Interesting theory. <laughs> uh, I will also say that this mention of Gore Vidal actually predates his appearance by 10 years, because I guess that would make it in season 16, <laughs> season 17, I would guess, since it's 10 years Ugh. down, uh, that he will actually make an appearance on the show. That was a long stretch for that Bill Oakley joke there, Miles. Thanks, man. <laughs> you know what I have an issue with is Marge's pep talk in this scene. I feel like she doesn't give Lisa enough time to talk. What do you mean? 
I mean, like, she just says, like, you know, be yourself. And then Lisa's clearly still upset and, like, and troubled and, and not feeling good. And Marge just gets up and walks out of the room. Which, again, you don't have the episode if she stays there and actually talks to Lisa. So she has to. But I just, I felt real bad for Lisa when Marge just was like, laters. You felt like she, I, I guess I could see that. Because, yeah, she basically is like, I'm sure you'll make plenty of friends. All you have to do is be yourself. Bye. <laughs> and like, she just, she just, like, leaves. So Yeah, yeah. You expect that talk about, like, you know, Lisa, you're really smart for your age. So, like, when you get older, you're going to make tons of friends. Once everyone else catches up to your intelligence level. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, At this point, though, Lisa kind of has a self-discovery. She's like, be myself. I've been myself for eight years and it hasn't worked. So she actually starts dumping out the contents of her suitcase on the bed. And like you can kind of see like she wasn't making great choices. She had like kind of a dorky swimsuit and a microscope, which she even calls herself out for like a microscope at the beach. What were you thinking? (laughs) <laughs> to be fair, there's probably a lot of dope stuff to look at through a microscope yeah. at the beach. So, I mean, it's not the worst idea. But for her new image, it definitely is. It's almost like she wanted to dress like a second grader, Miles. <laughs> so, we see that the car is loaded up. I love this line here. Bart is like, hey, I'm going to tighten Milhouse's straps again because he's fidgeting. And you see Milhouse is actually in a car seat, like for babies. <laughs> <laughs> I like the exchange between Homer and Lisa where he picks up her empty suitcase. Somebody's traveling light. Uh, maybe you're just getting stronger. Well, I have been eating more. <laughs> yeah, that's a great. I love that that's like Homer's logic is, oh, yeah, I guess I would be getting stronger. All that chewing. <laughs> yeah. And as we see the family and Millhouse roll out, you get everybody kind of saying bye to like the house and the dogs and the car or whatever. But you finally, at the very end of the act, the last thing we see is Lisa looking out of the window saying, Bye bye, Lisa Simpson. Lisa Simpson. Which we're going to go ahead and take a very quick break, but we'll be right back for our second act of Summer of Four Foot Two. Meet us on the beach. This is the Secret Transmission Podcast. We are a podcast about the strange and unusual, the secret and the conspiracies, the fringe and the supernatural. We're a podcast that talks about weird things like number stations, the Bermuda Triangle, the Salem Witch Trials, time travel, the moon landing, the Zika virus, serial killers, cults, the deep web, UFOs, superstitions. We cover it all. You can find us on iTunes, Stitcher, YouTube, and Google Play. You can also follow us on Twitter, at Secret Transpod, at S-E-C-R-E-T-T-R-A-N-S-P-O-D. Come listen to us try to explain the unexplainable. We come back for the start of our second act, and we have Bart asking the question we've all been wondering... When the hell are we getting to... Where the hell are we going? Okay, Miles, this is not fair. I knew you were going to do this to me. (laughs) I fucking knew you were going to do this to me. He purposely took Bart's line because Marge has to say the damn name of the place they're going. Accurate. Mm, It's called Little Pulagbat Squat Not Setaport. You nailed that, dude. Nice. (laughs) It's known as America's Scrod Basket. I thought Springfield was America's Scrod Basket. No, Springfield is America's Crud Bucket. At least... According to Newsweek. (laughs) And we see the Simpsons family arrive at the Flanders Beach House. I love the touch that they add here. This is a great joke because the Flanders have left a welcome letter that says, read me. And it actually says, well, diddly elkum, Simpsons. Oh, geez. He actually wrote diddly. He wrote diddly, Miles. Hey, that's the name of this show. Yeah. (laughs) And we see that he makes note that he left just a few helpful notes around the house. But when o- <laughs> when Homer opens the door, it's just like floor to ceiling everywhere. There's little post-it notes of things, I guess, instructions for literally everything. Yep. <laughs> including Marge goes to the fridge and sees a post-it that says, put food in me. Ooh, I'll take that. And we stick. see Homer stick it to his belly, which is a great joke in itself. <laughs> Marge is starting to get a little annoyed, though, because she opens the freezer and sees an ice tray, and each individual cube says, fill me. Well, duh. With what, Ned? But then she peels back and sees that there's a second later that says, with water. 
We then see Bart uh, checking out his room, which I guess is usually Todd's, because he finds a piggy bank with a note that says, please don't steal from me. <laughs> nice That's try, special. Todd. <laughs> and this is actually almost a like painful jab in a way, but at the same time, the way that they, they choose to, to go with it. It feels meaner to Marge than Marge takes it, I felt like. And, I, and she even kind of calls that out. But Marge is actually f- making the beds at the beach house, and she's trying to, like, encourage Lisa. Isn't this fun, honey? It must be exciting to make a different set of beds. I know you're joking, but it is. Say, why don't you put on your swimsuit and head for the beach? Huh, you know, it's uh, kind of funny. With all the craziness and confusion and mishigasha packing, I forgot to pack. Lisa, that's not like you at all. Exactly. Hmm. <laughs> we hear, though, at this point that Homer also forgot his swimsuit, but he declares proudly, I improvised. And his two doormats, like, taped together around his <laughs> waist. <laughs> as soon as he goes outside, immediately it's cherries and berries Woo! and a siren. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> we this is one of those moments like I always think back to when Krusty jumps out the window when the, the mob's waiting on him and you're just in the waiting room with the mob but you hear all the sound effects in the background. There's something that just makes it more funny that, that you're not actually seeing it happen. So like all you see in this instance is the front doorway and you just see the flashing lights. Right, you're only you don't actually see the action which makes yeah. it probably both cheaper for them and it's still really funny for us. You can animate it in your mind, Miles. Exactly. At this point, however, we see that Marge and Lisa are going shopping for new clothes since Lisa doesn't have any. And they actually go to TJ Zaymart, which is a spoof of defunct retailer Zayer, which is apparently the parent company for TJ Maxx, which still exists at least around Texas. Wow. Okay. Yeah. They go into the store and immediately Marge is kind of showing the same old like dorky swimsuits that Lisa has always worn. And at this point, Lisa is kind of like, Mom, I was kind of thinking we'd do like something different this year. And I love immediately Marge is like, okay, how about this cute little overall set? There's a starfish (laughs) on the tush. (laughs) Like Marge isn't trying to, but she's basically talking down to Lisa in a roundabout way here <laughs> oh oh yeah 100 percent. it's she's p- very much treating her like the baby though and i think that this is like i said this is a coming of age story it's just kind of flipped a little bit uh because we're so commonly used to especially in this type of show like we're so used to seeing kind of like bart's journeys and struggles more often than than lisa's but seeing this side of the coin is really interesting especially just putting it all into a new setting all of that is a lot of fun uh, Lisa actually runs away and finds something on her own, and it's a really dope look. Like, I think everybody who's probably ever heard of The Simpsons has probably seen this at least in, like, an image, because it's very commonly used on the internet. I see it all the time, uh, for various, you know, memes and whatnot, but Lisa's kind of wearing tie-dye, and she's got a hat, and she's got purple glasses, which I will actually say that you may kind of think this is either like a Mandela or possibly your like mind is playing a trick on you because there are people who are like no way those glasses weren't purple they were clear however both people are correct because in promotional materials the glasses were actually changed to clear however in the episode itself uh, they are in fact a light purplish pink color oh that's really interesting another animation tidbit by Miles I almost said the whiz kid. (laughs) Outside, Marge is ready to keep hanging out and go show off Lisa's new duds at like the ice cream parlor or wherever she (laughs) wants to go. But Lisa's kind of thinking maybe she'll go find some friends of her own. Okay. The way Marge says that is actually really cold. Like you can tell that she's actually hurt by that, that Lisa, her little girl is kind of leaving and she immediately latches on to, to Maggie saying like, I'm never going to let you go. And I do Ooh. love the, the close up and the look of terror we get in <laughs> poor Maggie's face. She's taking one for the team here, Miles. <laughs> we leave Marge and Maggie and cut back to Mark. Martin Billhouse. <laughs> I like those names. 
Barton Milhouse, who actually take a dive into the ocean, only they weren't aware of the fact that it was during low tide, so they immediately oh. crash and burn. I do love, just to kind of uh, keep throwing flame on the fire from earlier, as they're running to the beach, Bart yells out, last one in is a yearbook editor. Yeah. In other words, Elisa. <laughs> <laughs> and then, though, I, again, one of my favorite moments in this entire episode is when Homer comes driving by laughing, saying, <laughs> low tide, boys. And then we cut out, and you can see he's actually driving in the ocean, like he's wheels in the water. water. They are. Yeah. <laughs> Such a jerk, but in the funniest way. <laughs> Meanwhile, Lisa is off searching for friends, but she's not really having any luck. However, she might also not be choosing the best places to look, because she finds herself once again at the library, where her imagination does call out to her as she tries to resist. We see the character Pippi Longstockings appear. Lisa, read about my adventures in the South Seas and make me live again! We then see the character Eustace B. Tilly from The New Yorker. We've got periodicals on microfish. And then we see both Alice from Alice in Wonderland and the Mad Hatter. And Alice is very nervous here. Oh, won't you join our tea party? It would be ever so. And the Mad Hatter pulls a gun and grabs Alice. Don't do it, Lisa! It's a trap! Run! Run! And she runs. She listens to her imaginary friends. Kind of an odd... When you really put it in context, it really is odd that all this is happening in Lisa's head. (laughs) She's imaginative. Lisa is starting to get a little depressed and down about the fact that she isn't finding any kids to hang with, but then when she's about to give up and she kind of collapses on the boardwalk, she starts to hear voices from underneath the boardwalk. So he's all like... (laughs) I can totally hear him going that. Only kids are that incoherent. And then we see Lisa, she gets excited and she goes running under the boardwalk and she actually sees that there's a girl and three boys around her age all chatting it up. And uh, she starts to go and make an approach, but unfortunately her her plan is thwarted by seagulls. (laughs) It's not your fault. You don't control the birds. Someday you will, but not now. That's one of my favorite lines. That's a good line. (laughs) Someday you will. I also will point out, too, during this entire walk before she gets startled by the birds, Lisa is practicing over and over in her head the line, like, you know, whatever. And Yardley Smith on the commentary actually does say that they practice this line a lot, like maybe more than any other line that she's ever said, because they really, really wanted to get that that 90s to teen vibe going from this. (laughs) There's a lot of great stretching of the Lisa voice in this episode by Yardley. Like, I think she gets a lot more to work with in this one. So you get to see a lot more vibrant of a character. Sure. That makes sense. Again, it is a a, a very Lisa-centric episode, so the fact that it's her time to shine really makes sense. And this episode, like no other, really does put Lisa in the spotlight. Even even other episodes that have heavily featured Lisa, I feel a lot of times will uh, put a lot of the weight on Homer. (laughs) I didn't mean that as a joke, but it's funny. Um, But, you know, they'll they'll put some of the, the, the funny on Homer, but this is really... I mean, there's a couple of gags that Homer's involved in, of course, because it is a ensemble show but at the end of the day this really is lisa's story there's not really much of a b plot in this episode too which might be a first time where it's like all about just lisa which again look at how wonderful an episode it is so makes makes for good television miles yeah like you know whatever (laughs) (laughs) so lisa tries again she walks up to the crowd she gets her confidence and she just tries a simple uh hi What's up? And then the girl from the group calls out, Hey, I like your hat. A compliment. Scanning for sarcasm. It's clean. Go. Lisa very excitedly thanks this new potential friend and then observes that they have skateboards. You guys skate? And one of the teens basically says that they like to, but they can't because the cops keep on confiscating the boards. Well, I might know a place that would be virtually deserted. 
And Lisa takes her new friends to none other than her old friend, the library. All right. This is the the issue I have with this episode. The animation under the boardwalk. When Lisa's looking up at the at the four kids, the far kid to the right, that might actually be Rick. I forgot if that's actually him. It's the kid that's got his hair parted in the middle. And when Lisa He's got looks, a weird ass forehead. Yeah, when he turns his head to the side, it's basically he's got like two lumps, but like one lump is bigger than the other, and there's nothing in between the lumps and the part, and it looks like he's missing a whole chunk of his head. And I've noticed that <laughs> since I was a little kid, and it always bothers me. But the rest of the animation in this episode's great, but in that one like that one moment that lasts for just a few seconds always catches my attention and distracts me. Well, we've talked about that. Like, I think it's the Instagram page that it's like Simpsons characters, but looking at them head on or face on or like right, you know, Front looking face. straight forward. Yeah, they're terrifying. They do not look good. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, he's definitely got like this weird, like heart lumpy head. It's, it's odd. <laughs> but in the future scenes, it'll be fixed. <laughs> there you go. Uh, We do need to go ahead and point out real quick that Erin, the girl that liked Lisa's hat, is voiced by none other than Christina Ritchie, who was actually unavailable to make it into the studio. They had a conflict, so they actually ended up having to record her lines over an ISDN line, which uh, Bill Oakley and Josh Weinstein explained on the commentary that that was like high-speed internet before there was DSL. It was the best they had available at the time. (laughs) I will say, though, it does sound pretty good. Like, I don't think oh, yeah. it's necessarily as perfect as some of the other uh, voice actors have been. Uh, just because anytime you're recording over the phone, it, you, I think you're you're going to lose some of that chemistry. However, they did a great job, and it feels like a very, very Simpsons character. Like, it's not just a one-dimensional character. I would have never known that she wasn't, like, live if you hadn't have told me, so. Oh, there you go. Here we go lisa's news friends are very happy with her however because they seemingly can skate under uninterrupted at this basically deserted library uh and while the boys skate aaron and lisa talk lisa points out that it's her goony brother bartholomew that reads and she usually just hangs out up front you like to hang out too (laughs) well it beats doing stuff yeah stuff sucks Yardley Smith on the commentary points out how much she loves the line, stuff sucks. <laughs> <laughs> and it really is a great line. Sometimes it's exactly how I feel. Hey, that's how we all felt in the 90s, man. Right? Yeah. And then, then the Y2K happened and everybody was just happy all of a sudden. All of a sudden we wanted stuff again. Sounds like a conspiracy. We, however, see that from the bushes surrounding the library that Bart and Milhouse are actually spying on Lisa and her friends. And Milhouse is very surprised to see that Lisa not only has friends, but she's dressed like Blossom. (laughs) The whole thing smacks of effort, man. (laughs) Blossom, for those who don't catch the reference, was a sitcom, I want to say it was on the TGIF block, right around Boy Meets World and, like, Step by Step, the dinosaurs, all that good stuff. Blossom was played by actress Mayim Bialuk, which who now is on the Big Bang Theory as Sheldon's girlfriend. I can't remember her name. Amy. Amy Farrah Fowler. Boom. Nice. That one's the easiest of the names, so... (laughs) (laughs) So we see that Lisa now is kind of getting called on her bullshit when one of the guys skates up to her and offers to let her use the board. And instead of, like, declining, she's like, oh, yeah, I can do this. And this is where she hops up on a skateboard and actually might arguably be saved by her brother in this moment. Because Bart comes hot-shotting in on his skateboard, pulling off all sorts of tricks, and it essentially kind of, like, lands in this, like, real, like, cocky pose and is like, my friendship, you know you want it. (laughs) This is where the guys are just like, oh, he's, like, trying so hard. The whole thing smacks of effort, man. And this is where Lisa is kind of like, oh, yeah, that's my dorky brother, Bart. Tholomew. (laughs) (laughs) and then bart gets pissed later that night 
Bart continues to get pissed off because he has to play the mystery date game with Milhouse and his parents while Lisa gets to go and hang out with her friends on the beach. This might be a little bit too of a racy game for the Flanderses, but I will say we're going from a scene that I talked about a terrible animation to a scene that might have quite possibly my all-time favorite animation moments with Homer here in a second. With the the dud? <laughs> no, no, yes. I know exactly what you're talking about. The way, his, uh, yeah, we're gonna get there for for sure because that's a, a great moment, and you're absolutely right. The physical humor there is is amazing. But uh, real quick note on both the beach house and the mystery dating game. Uh, this is actually based on Josh Weinstein's parents' house in New Hampshire, where the Simpsons writers actually did go a couple of times for a kind of a retreat type situation, just to kind of like vacation and hang out together. So they were all actually very familiar with this home, and that's why they were able to bring this energy of that real life place that they visited to this episode josh weinstein also points out that the dating game was based off of his real life as well because he found himself as a child having to play that once and described it as an absolutely miserable game to play as a little boy i won't lie miles i a lot of times when i was being babysat when i was younger i was going over to friends of the family's house and they had three daughters so like every so how many times did you get the dud is what i would like to know i don't know because it was the one where you had to like call the phone and you had to figure out what the clues who the boy was oh my gosh yeah (laughs) it was like we have nothing better and then like first of all every time i got over there they were watching barney because the youngest was like two so not only did i have to watch barney when i was like 10 years old but then i also had to go play this who's the boy that you're calling game Honestly, that makes a lot of sense. I feel like that explains your confusion so much. (laughs) (laughs) Hey, but if anything, it it helped improve my detective skills. But it does seem like the the game in the episode is coming to the end because Marge tells Homer, open the door for your mystery date. Ooh, the captain of the football team. He's a dreamboat. Don't wait up, Marge. (laughs) I love that so much. Uh, however, Bart's not really having the luck because when he opens the door, he gets the dud. And I love this so much because immediately Homer starts pointing out, hey, the dud looks just like Milhouse. He looks like you, Poindexter. <laughs> and it's that it's that moment that I'm talking about with the animation because after the door opens and it looks just like Milhouse, it cuts to Homer and Marge. And Homer's eyes are wide and this really slow, really big smile forms across his face. And it's just so damn funny to see how, to see all the joy that it brings Homer in this moment. There was a time when I was younger, and and you know, Carlos, there was a moment in our lives when we were younger where I think we watched that moment on repeat, like late at night once when we had like a birthday slumber party or something. And over and over again, we watched this one moment and we just could not stop laughing at it. It was so damn funny. And every time I see this scene now, I just can't help but laugh my ass off. Uh, it's funny because this was not the moment of animation I was talking about either. So I think that we. Uh, oh wow! But that's a, a great observation. Great observation. Uh, I do like so we also come back around because this is where Bart loses it. And he's like, "Man, why does Lisa get to hang out with her friends and we have to play this stupid game?" But Homer's immediately like, "What are you talking about? You get to hang out with the dud here." And then he looks at Milhouse like, "Come on, Poindexter, stand up for yourself." <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Against me, who just called you that? <laughs> We cut down to the beach where Lisa is actually teaching her new friends about the wildlife on the beach, specifically hermit crabs. Uh, When a hermit crab leaves its old shell and grows, it gets into a bigger shell. And Lisa actually took the old shell and said, a gift from my favorite crustacean, which immediately raises suspicion amongst her friends. Hey, did you learn that word from a teacher or something? Uh, no, I, uh, I, I heard it on Baywatch. Oh, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. <laughs> We cut to Homer again, which does have some comic relief and arguably one of the funnier scenes of this episode because it's Homer and fireworks. But we see him at the Little Value Mart, which is very, very similar to the Quickie Mart, including the person behind the counter looking similar-ish to a poo. 
Hi, uh, let me have some of those porno magazines, a large box of condoms, a couple of those panty shields, and some illegal fireworks, and one of those disposable enemas. Eh, uh, make it two. <laughs> My apologies, sir, but the sale of fireworks is prohibited in this state and is punishable by a... Ding. Follow me. <laughs> the, the ding was the last customer leaving, by the way. Uh, and then it's just Homer and the clerk who immediately gets taken to the secret back room where he's told any red blooded flag fearing American would love the M320. Celebrate the independence of your nation by blowing up a small part of it. Take my money. Yeah, pretty much. Exactly. I just I, I love that whole exchange that Homer has because he's literally he's loudly asking for everything that people are ashamed to go buy at the counter just to hide the fact that he wants fireworks. Yeah, trying to blend in. It's like it was porno, condoms, booze, panty shields, and, and uh, disposable enemas <laughs> and some illegal fireworks. Yeah, uh, this red blooded flag fearing American scene was a parody of a scene from American Graffiti. Uh, the M320 did not exist at that time. If it does, I don't know, but it was just a parody of M80s, which were kind of the holy grail of fireworks when the writers of this episode were kids. Uh, and this whole scene in general is just super funny, and Homer does end up taking home a... what looks like essentially a stick of dynamite. <laughs> I just love Marge's reaction when she sees all the shit that he bought. Oh my god, yeah. <laughs> She's going through the purchase. I don't know what you had planned tonight, homie, but count me out. <laughs> Didn't you buy any meat? <laughs> this baby's sure to kill something. Uh, before we get to this great, great sequence, I do want to point out that Lisa is actually hanging out at the beach house with her with her friends at the same time here. And Aaron is actually complimenting Lisa, saying like, wow, your mom's so much cooler than mine. Like at this point, she would have definitely been in here trying to like service Rice Krispie Squares and Whoops. bang. And immediately in the background, like as Aaron's saying this, you see uh, Marge pull the old walk in with a tray of Rice Krispie squares and Tang and then immediately turn around and leave the room. It's the grandpa walking in and out meme before grandpa did it. Exactly. The Simpsons outdid it to themselves. (laughs) So Homer's got his fireworks. All he needs is a lighter, some matches. And I love when he asks Bart, who doesn't have any, he's actually disappointed. He's like, aww. Bart's so he's just does not doing it, man. He he's he's, he's off his game. Yeah, yeah. But Homer then makes the very wise decision to light the M three twenty with the stove in the kitchen, and immediately it catches the fuse like three quarters of the way down, <laughs> and it turns into a very funny sequence. This was what I think is the funniest animation sequence in the episode. Homer, just 100% comic relief, physical comedy, running around with this tiny fuse. It's a parody of old Looney Tunes cartoons. Or Adam West, one... Batman with the freaking bomb in his hands. Perfect example. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. At one point, he throws it in the fridge and he holds his back against it, preparing for explosion before realizing, ah, the beer! <laughs> uh, so he throws it into the dishwasher. And in... God. And then the fucking thing explodes and backs up the sink with, like, all this black sludge where Homer Fish just bones. starts whistling and walking away. But my favorite part of this whole sequence, and I, I honestly, this is the first time I've ever caught this, maybe why I liked it so much. Immediately, you cut from Homer whistling and walking away to Milhouse and Bart talking on the front porch and in the background through the doorway you can see Marge mopping up the mess. Oh, this is your first time catching that? <laughs> I've never caught that before. Just so quick and so subtle in the background where Marge is of course left with the uh left with the ball when Homer drops it. And the part that kills me is he could have just easily thrown it outside, but he had to... <laughs> yeah, he was right by... He's literally right by the outdoors where he could have thrown it in the sand. Yep. <laughs> blowing up a small part of his nation, the there American way. Maybe he didn't want to throw it near the kids. <laughs> Bart is becoming increasingly more jealous of Lisa, and he's actually now starting to get mad because Lisa's kind of knocking off some of Bart's old catchphrases, and me- immediately we hear Lisa calling out, Don't have a cow, man! See? That's my expression. Oh, you haven't said that in four years. Let Lisa have it. It's the principal. She's got to learn. No. Now park your keister, meester. Ay, caramba. (laughs) So, funny uh, note on this line where Bart 
where Marge says, you haven't said that line in four years. Actually, if you've been counting, it's been six years, three months, and 22 days since Bart Ooh. said the line, don't have a cow, man. However, that did become an absolute meme before there were memes existing because it was all over t-shirts and merchandise and everything, even though he really only said it in the first, maybe second season. Wow. I was going to ask, has it been four seasons? But nope, it's been a lot more. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So we have a sweet moment between Aaron and Lisa on the beach where Aaron gives Lisa a friendship bracelet and Lisa immediately is like, oh my God, my first friend ship bracelet. <laughs> <laughs> and to reciprocate, uh, she didn't plan anything, but Lisa gives Aaron the necklace that she made from that hermit crab shell earlier. She's making her care about stuff. Yeah. Uh, though... Some sinister action is happening from a distance in the bushes. We actually see Bart spying once again. This time, though, it's really funny because he's using Milhouse's glasses as binoculars. That's not how those work, people. <laughs> uh, however, when Bart gets a plan and runs off with Milhouse's glasses, he's left there searching the beach saying, Bart, I need my glasses. <laughs> and then a sand crab comes crawling up that Milhouse starts to pet. <laughs> And nice that job. dark moment brings us to the end of our second act, but don't worry, we'll be right back for the conclusion of Summer of Four Foot Two. Hey guys, I'm here to talk about a serious problem today. One that can affect us all, but it's also a problem that can be fixed with everyone's help. I'm Richie the Whiz Kid, and I'm talking about podcasts. So many podcasts in the Somebody's Network need your help. They are being malnourished. Some are living in terribly harsh conditions. And some are Canadian. But with your help, a corner can be turned for these poor podcasts. Especially in regards to Best Darn Diddly. You can go to popthreads.com and use the code SIMPSONS at checkout. Or... You can buy Best Darn Diddly merch at tpublic.com. Most importantly, you can go to patreon.com slash bestdarndiddly to donate now for as little as $1 a month. For less than four cents a day, you can bring a smile to these poor podcasters' faces. So let's work together to end the poverty of these podcasts. Let's be honest. You were probably just going to get a crusty burger with that dollar anyways. Cut to the pictures of starving podcasts. We open the third act with another animation sequence that I just absolutely love. It's Lisa being tossed up in the air parachute style where her friends have like the cloth that they like throw i don't i don't know how to describe that it's like you have a parachute everybody's holding it around the edge you're landing in the middle they toss you up you land it's what kids used to do yeah i don't know if kids still do that but they definitely used to i i remember doing this in gym class uh when i was in elementary school you needed a lot more kids for that though yeah it was a, a much larger parachute and a lot larger amount of kids that yeah. is accurate but this is so great because we're kind of following Lisa as she's thrown up in the air and she's actually yelling out, I'm dizzy, I'm nauseous, but I'm popular. Uh -huh. And that's when we see this great, it's almost like a, a shark movie where you see the shark's tail come, come out of the water oh, for the first time. Don't but you just see the very top of Bart's head sticking over a sand dune. And each time Lisa's thrown up into the air, you see a little bit more and you see Bart's coming a little bit closer. And then as he gets even closer, you realize that he's holding a copy of the Springfield Elementary School yearbook in his hand, and he has this evil smile on his face, and he's even nodding as he looks at his sister, like, yeah, I am about to do this. Meanwhile, Lisa is sitting there shaking her head, like, no, please, no. Just a terrible, terrible act. Honestly, this might be the meanest thing Bart has done to date. To date, yeah, I'm sure. Yeah, I, I don't know. I mean, he might beat it in the future, but to date, I can't think of any other episode that we've covered where Bart has done something more just intentionally sinister. Yeah, and I'm not going to stick up for Bart, but there is going to be kind of a liberating factor to this moment. 
Agreed. I, I I have some notes at the very end of the script that we'll talk about for sure. I think we might have some some notes there, but for now, what happens is exactly what happens. Uh, for now, what happens is exactly what you'd expect to happen. Bart shows her friends the yearbook. Lisa's humiliated. She runs away crying, and we actually see at breakfast the next morning where Lisa and Bart sit at the table together with Marge in the background, and they're sitting in silence until Bart starts to pseudo-apologize. He, it's not even an apology. He's just saying, you know, I guess maybe I did go just a, a hair bit too far. And, man, I don't know how many times I said I love the animation sequence in this episode. It's the uh, my new favorite joke. <laughs> as far as this podcast goes, but <laughs> as soon as Marge leaves the room, Lisa's entire demeanor changes. She stands up, her face becomes menacing. She grabs Bart by the collar. Uh, Bart had just uh, pointed out that the lesson that she should have learned is that it's important to always be yourself. And Lisa responds, I know exactly who I am. I am the sister of a rotten, jealous, mean little sneak. You cost me my only friends, and you ruined my life. <laughs> then I love the animation, because it pans to the other side of the table, and you see the box of cereal move, and Millhouse is right has been sitting there the entire time. <laughs> well, first Marge actually walks back into the room and Lisa and Bart reset so that Lisa looks like she's just been sitting there the whole time. Bart looks like visibly like, holy shit, what did I do? <laughs> and then when uh, Lisa moves the box of cereal, Millhouse is just there. However, I will say uh, that if you look in the wide shot when they first start the scene, Millhouse is definitely not sitting behind that cereal box. <laughs> A little thing we call animation trick. The old Martin Billhouse. <laughs> this tension is broken when Marge announces that they're going to be visiting the local carnival, which is another staple of summer vacation that a lot of the animators felt like was part of their childhood and they wanted to, to bring into this episode. But Bart and Lisa are just straight on feuding at this point they do a little carnival game where you're supposed to like squirt the water gun to fill up the balloon and lisa just starts spraying bart that has happened once before in the simpsons miles according to my guidebook the simpsons a complete guide to our favorite family nelson did a similar thing to martin way back in lisa the beauty queen Oh, nice. Yeah, as I say, I think it was between different characters, but that makes that makes sense. I do love that Marge threatens to get a carny to break it up. <laughs> <laughs> I also really like on the whirly gig, which is just one of those uh, really fast spinning things where your like back is pushed up against the wall because of centrifugal force, and then the floor falls out from under you. Lisa and Bart are trying to spit at each other, but both are unsuccessful because they both keep hitting Millhouse. <laughs> <laughs> Poor Millhouse. <laughs> ah! And then finally, this is where Lisa hits full-on rock bottom, because they're at the bumper cars, and despite Marge reminding them that, remember, it's not about bumping, you don't have to hit each other, Bart and Lisa are in a full-on Wild Wild West-style stare-down, where they're about to draw as soon as they get the, the go button, essentially. Only, when the light goes green, Bart's car goes to full charge and lisa is stuck with a busted bumper car which uh. if you ever had happened to you really is the worst like it's the absolute worst experience even if you get one that's not fully broken but it's just slow or it, like kind of turns one direction constantly yeah. i fucking hate that especially when you have to wait to get in the cars to begin with mm -hmm. so lisa gets bumped by bart so hard that she goes blasting through the barrier and actually ends up rolling down a hill and uh crashing against a tree and then just to truly put the dark cherry on top a bird's nest falls and lands on her head though this i think is the moment that bart realizes like oh shit he's gone too far because he you can see bart looking out of the mess that he's created and you really do again great job with the animators because the, the look of guilt on his face is incredible well she runs off crying too you done messed up bart Though, things are just getting worse, because when she arrives home, she can hear her former friends talking to each other, saying, like, oh, we gotta get out of here before they get home type of things. 
But Lisa catches them in the act of vandalizing their car and decides, you know what? Yeah, I, you know I'm a dork now. Just please leave me alone and go away. But wait. The kids point out, Lisa, no, look. And as Lisa looks at the family vehicle, it actually reads, the shells spell out, Lisa rules. And they decorated it to look in a way that she would like. Well, I mean, and they also learned things from her, Miles. She taught them about cool things like nature and why they shouldn't drink seawater. And Aaron actually points out specifically, look, we don't care who you were. You can't fake the kind of good person that you are. And again, animation is incredible because you can see the look in Lisa's face in this moment, like change when she realizes like, holy shit, I actually have friends. Yeah, you're going to think I probably read too much into this, but I had never noticed this before. But after they start talking to Lisa, she's standing on the front porch. And I believe it's the only time I've seen the address to the building, but it's 916 in the background. And I don't know why it stood out to me this time. Well, I do know why it stood out. It's going to sound really stupid to you probably, but the nine and the six are like reflecting. The Simpsons are wishing me a happy birthday. There you go. <laughs> the nine and the six are the exact same, but opposite. If you think about it, like reflecting wise. And the one in the middle is Lisa, where like she's perfectly balanced between her old life and her new life. And the way that they shape the numbers behind her just like really caught my attention. And I was like, I wonder if that, that number is on purpose to, to have like that kind of Zen moment right there in the background. Or maybe my blood sugar's low and I'm seeing things that aren't actually there. I like the idea of that, like kind of represents a yin and a yang. I, and now they did not at all comment or recognize this on the commentary but that doesn't mean that an animator didn't have that idea to say the least but regardless cool observation thank you thank you and if you go back and watch this episode you can see that her friends when bart shows in the yearbook they don't actually look like appalled at the stuff they're reading she runs off crying and they're just reading the yearbook so like she kind of prematurely your mind plays things out to be worse than they actually are. Always, hundred sort percent. Of your mind always is worse, makes it worse than it actually is. I I think that's so true. Uh, but just while Lisa is recognizing how great things are, she says out loud, "This is the most thoughtful thing anyone has ever." Sweet merciful crap, my car. Homer arrives home and realizes that while this is a thoughtful gesture to Lisa, it's still <laughs> vandalism. <laughs> like he still has a bunch of sea shit like glued to his car shit (laughs) and though this is such a great great simpsons reset because in a way it's cheating but it's not because they're on vacation so they can leave this set of characters here in this contained bubble it's the season finale so it's kind of okay to stretch that reset just a little bit because they are about to go on break and we are heading back home where lisa will presumably become herself again however she will always have this impactful moment or summer vacation that will hopefully you would think would shape the character moving forward well and then we get the moment that we talk about the the surprise moment where bart's handing lisa her yearbook yeah absolutely this is a great great moment of redemption because at first of course lisa is mad when bart's like hey i showed your friend your yearbook one more time before we left but then she quickly realizes that this was Bart trying to make things right because now her previously blank autograph pages that had been passed around her entire elementary school without getting signed is entirely filled up with her friends writing nice things and telling her how cool she is. I, one of my favorites is just like, Hey, I kind of think you're cool. Or I think I kind of like you or something like that. It's very like nineties ish. Like, uh, yeah, you're cool or whatever. Yeah. yeah. Like, you know, whatever. <laughs> And then one boy in particular signed her yearbook. This is so creepy. Like, this is where Millhouse, like, crosses over into that, like, like, predatorial pervert mode. I don't know. He's like, hey, Lisa, I signed your yearbook, too. See you in the car. And the look on his face just gives you shudders. Uh, uh, uh. And finally, we see Homer telling his family to say one last goodbye to the beautiful beach Right before he decides to throw a Buzz Cola can right on it, littering it one last time before he leaves. I both like this sequence and it really makes me cringe because I hate 
littering on the beach specifically. Litter wherever you want, other than the sand. No, I'm kidding. Don't but litter. He but wasn't, he wasn't littering, Miles. He threw a can out of the car. You're not going to convince me that just because a hermit crab happens to move in. I'm like, I constantly think when I watch the sequence, I'm like, oh, that poor hermit crab is going to get all cut up from the rusty aluminum and die. <laughs> Because that's well, what he has happens. Some kind of shell to protect it. Yeah, exactly. He's he's a death sentence, is what he gets. But <laughs> it is a funny uh, a funny scene, and we actually get the Beach Boys all summer long playing over the Simpsons credits, uh, and even get a kind of like uh, saxophony beach music like uh, jingle for the Gracie films at the very end. Aww. And that brings us to the end of our third act and to the end of the episode, Summer of Four Foot Two. Richie, was there anything else that you or that book of yours want to point out before we get out of here? Well, we pointed out the water gun moment. I thought that one of the stands that flashed by on the beach was goal things considered, which I thought was <laughs> <laughs> But other than that, nothing to uh, write home about except there was a bomb in the little value mart. It was called the Bang Time Fun Bomb, so I kind of want to see what that one does too. But yeah, this is uh, this is the iconic Lisa episode, right? Outside of iconoclasting, this is the iconic Lisa episode, or maybe the uh, the Bleeding Gums Murphys episodes. But I, I put this one above those just a hair. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. Because I don't know, she comes into her own, and I, I think there is a something to be said about her deciding not to be herself. She need and getting to stretch herself a little bit. And then having to realize it's okay to just be yourself while you're stretching, basically. So, uh, I mean, and you'll never hear about these characters again that she meets. This is before you could just tweet at somebody or text message somebody. So, it's not like they can just uh, constantly talk. But I would have liked to imagine that they exchange, like, landline numbers so that Lisa could talk to Aaron every once in a while. Or, like, yeah, see if you come back for vacation again here in the future type of thing. I mean, you'd have to go with the Flanderses, but maybe. That's true. Yeah, maybe not (laughs) worth it. Not worth it. Very cool. Well, the only other thing I'll say is we talked a little bit about it, but this episode has so much new, both Lisa's look, the beach clothes for the other Simpsons family, all the new characters and all the new locations. This episode was actually a pretty big burden on the animation department. However... Everyone involved was so thrilled with the way that this episode invokes the spirit of summer vacation. And I have to agree. Yes. I think it, it really does. Like this, this puts me in the mood for summer. And that was a very important thing for the creators of the show to do because of the schedule of The Simpsons. They were always off in the summer and they hadn't had the opportunity to put these things into a script yet. So uh, a lot of uh, several years of ideas coming together to form this very special episode. And I think it's a very great and fitting way to say farewell to season seven. Absolutely. But not farewell quite yet, Miles, because the most daunting task of all sits before us and i'm even scared about the list this time that's true that will uh we will of course have our best darn diddly season seven finale spectacular spectacular next week but first rich tell everybody where they can find you online you can find me online at the whiz underscore kid 23 on twitter you can also find my lovely co-host miles at mr most days off and you can find our show at Best Darn Diddly. That's D I D D L Y. Thank you guys again so much for tuning into this week's episode. We always appreciate it when you hit that download button, share it with your friends, do all those other great things that all podcasts ask you to do every time you listen to them. Richie and I will be back again with you next week for our season seven finale spectacular. And hey, listening to our podcast beats doing stuff. Yeah, stuff sucks. And of course, until next time, be cromulent to each other. Hi, I'm Drew. I'm Nate. And I'm Tanner. And we are the hosts of Headline Heroes. Every week we take a bizarre, out there article. Germans build underground pipeline for beer. An attempt to create a superhero or villain. The obvious one is that they have a giant robot that runs off of beer. Along the way we discuss powers, design a costume, and of course, struggle with a name. Graham Graham Sam Sam? No, no. (laughs) Graham Graham Sam Sam? No! And inevitably we get off subject and talk about the really important stuff. I did go to Bill Engvall's website. 
website, and I just want to tell you a couple of things I'm seeing here. Please do. I wish you would. But we always arrive with the super creation we are proud of. Join Headline Heroes every Tuesday as we try to make reality a little more super.